learn what we can go through. I've been really trying to summarize it as much as possible. So, vascular anomalies are a heterogeneous group of congenital blood vessel disorders, multiply referred to as benignants. They are subcategorized into vascular tumors and malformations. A primary distinction between the tumors and the malformations is where they come in from. So that the tumors are growing um, or you have cellular hyperplasia and the malformations, you have localized defects in the vascular morphogenesis. So as it's being formed, then you have those abnormal formations occurring. Okay. Each anomaly is characterized by specific morphology, pathophysiology, clinical behavior. And manifestation. Both vascular tumors and malformations may occur in the, in the body. So, in classifying the anomalies, we have Mulliken and Lowerkin. They did a classification in 82, and this has been revised by the International Society for the Study of Vascular Anomalies in 2014. Another classification is by Humbert who also came up with some form of classification. But then, the one by ESVA is what is being used. So for that, you have vascular tumors. Those are the neoplastics. So you have benign, locally aggressive, or borderline, and malignant. Then we have the vascular malformations, which are non neoplastic So you have the simple and compound. So you can have a simple, maybe venous malformation, capillary, or and you can have a combination of these ones. They have those of the major new vessels and those associated with other anomalies like the syndromes. Then, as, after this classification, they also noticed that there are new diagnoses that are being made that are not among any of the two. So those are placed under the provisionally unclassified vascular anomalies. So with the Hamburg uh, classification, he rather depended on whether um, it's extra uh, trampular or trampular form. So we will stick with the International Society in classification. So with the benign, you have a cocktail of them, but the most common is a hemangioma, which we have the infantile and congenital type. Then the locally aggressive, we have the juvenile angiofibroma, glumous tumor, Tapped angioma, carpal seeds. Then the malignant ones are rare, about just a, a percentage, and the most common are the angiosarcomas. So with the hemangioma, they are the most common, as I've mentioned. And with the classification, you have the infantile and the uh, congenital. The infantile ones are not present at birth; you don't see it. But then, by two weeks to about two months, it appears. Um, of the fetus. With a congenital, it means that the child is born with it, and usually those are the ones that we call as birth ones. So there are two basic types for the congenital. The rapidly involving um, congenital hemangiomas, that's the rich, and the non-involuting, uh, sorry, involuting, the non-involuting congenital hemangiomas, that's the rich. Then we also have the intermediate type. So the rich usually, as the name goes, rapidly involutes on its own, regresses, and then by two years it's gone. And the niche usually may persist or does not regress completely, and about 40% of them will require intervention. So we look at the infantile hemangioma. So that's a child which is born with something on the forehead, and um, it's the most common infantile. New plasmas, and then you usually see them in the first two weeks of life, and it has a natural history. So we have the proliferative phase, the evolutive phase, and the evolutive phase. So the child is born, and within the first two weeks to a month, you see a purple color, or for us, dark skin, I don't know, it's maybe more darkish in color appearing on the skin. And then usually you can palpate it because it has. Um, then as it progresses, grows, and then within the proliferative phase, you are going to see it elevating more, becoming more tense, and then when you come, it's not compressible. 
So that the child that was born on day one, there was nothing on the face or anywhere. A month later, a small purple uh, spot developed on the lip. In two months, it was growing bigger. Three months, it was quite big, very tense. And that's the qualitative phase for the genes. And then with the evolutive phase, the color begins to fade. Then it becomes less uh, tense, so you can be able to compress it. And this will continue for about five to ten years. Then with the involuted face, then it means the color is almost all gone. They have new skins over the face and it occurs around ten to twelve years, leaving some scarring on those bodies over where the animal is. So so uh, can be anywhere as we've mentioned, and usually can be superficial, deep, or intravestral. So the complications that can arise with your ulcerations, infections, if it's within the um, ophthalmic vessels, can have visual impairment within the around those major areas in the chest, you can have airway obstructions. Within the auditory canal, you can have auditory canal obstruction. You can also have very large visceral ones that can cause congestive heart failure. The treatment usually as the, uh, the natural history has gone. If it's asymptomatic, usually it may evolve on its own. But then if it's very huge and it's causing symptoms, then intervention may be required. Spontaneous regression, as we said, is most common. And when there are uh, symptoms for intervention, it's recommended. In diagnosing hemangioma, we can do ultrasound if it's superficial. CT, MRI, geography, and the next day. So on ultrasound, what can you see? That's if usually it's the benchmark thing. So there's something superficial that is growing or changing. Then the doctor may ask for an ultrasound. So grayscale, what are you going to see? Most of the time, you are going to see a um, hyperogenic mass with some cystic areas. And then when you put color, you will see through. And then when you do the dynamics, you see um, the spectra before. So this one um, was a, somebody with a mass on the arm, and then an ultrasound was done that showed a heterogeneous mass. Doppler showed flow within the region. Someone may say, is it malignant or is it... Um, but then it depends on the clinical history, as you said, usually from childhood and to be growing in size. And so you may need other imaging modalities to confirm your diagnosis, but then that's how um, a human gene will look like. Usually they have low resistance arterial flow when you do your spectrum. So there's another one that was in the subcutaneous layer. He looked heterogeneous but mostly hypergogenic and he showed intense um, increased Doppler when we do plan interrogation. Another thing that can help you is the presence of, uh, when you do x-rays, is the presence of flavonoids. And because they are mass-like, they also cause periostar reaction in cortical thickening. So if you look at this x-ray, there's just a soft tissue mass which is not really showing over here. But the basic thing that you are seeing is the non-specific periostar reaction that's over there. With the addition of clinical history, you can make a, a, a possible suggestion of, or definitely you know that there's a mass or something sitting there. Since the, the history is a soft tissue mass, and you are seeing a movie change around it. So that was MRI faster team when we got it. That should be intense enhancement of the lesion. It was more of a soft tissue in my gene. Another way that you can make a diagnosis is the presence of flavonoids. And then apart from the flavonoids, you realize that there's also cortical changes between the adjacent and so you can make an inference of the possible soft tissue in my genome and then make further imaging to make your diagnosis. Here you can really see the recent center so you are sure that these are flavonoids associated with the soft tissue mass. One of your differentials will be a human genome. But remember that venous malformations also can give you flavonoids so when we get there. So this is another one, the, the large soft tissue mass, multiple calcific densities within it. And then 
arterial and various studies showed that it was more of a hemorrhaging. CT can also be helpful where the flebulates will also be seen. The very small ones can also be picked up. And then you see numerous serpentine vascular channels that are enhancing. You may see fat in the adjacent tissue. Because as it evolves, you get more fatty replacement. Okay. MRI is a major imaging modality, and then usually you see heterogeneous mass. On T1, you have increase that's because of the fat that's surrounding it. And then on the T2, also you have high signal because of the fat as well as the flu. That's it. So this um, patient had a soft tissue mass. Plain x rays showed that there were calcific densities within it. And then MRI showed a hypo intense lesion on T1, hyper intense on T2. And as you said, GB has vivid enhancement contrast. Another one with soft tissue swelling around the finger, the digits. And then x ray showed flavorings within the soft tissue. And this one too, the same thing, extensive with some sclerosis and minimal changes in the adjacent and MRI showed the lesion, as we said, hyperintense on T1 hyper and then enhancing the D on both contrast. Another image showed something similar. But then aside that, we also see changes within the bones, latent changes with um, the cortex are intact, but there's deformity of the bone. Some are be even shortening up. So then you'll be thinking of more of the phases. So as we've mentioned, it's high, ISO to high contents on MRI T1 and hyper on T2. So that's the imaging of that there. Clinical history will be very, very important. Another imaging modality will be essential because most pathologies are high point T1, high point T2. So that was an infant that um, was born with this lesion around the, um, it, it appeared a few days after delivery. And then it was growing in size. MRI showed this large hyper intense lesion on T2 with some areas of um, signal growth, suggesting of flavorism. So as we mentioned, as it's involuting, you have more fat replacement. So the lesions become more heterogeneous and being bright, both on T1 and T2, because of the fat content. MRA is very, very helpful, especially when you do dynamic time enhanced study, where you are flowing with time. And then you see the way the, the lesion enhances and the way it uh, wash, washes out. So usually, it enhances the lesion. So this is the lesion in the parotid on the right side, hypointense on T1, and then with the T1 uh, post contrast, you see enhancement of the lesion. T2 is hyperintense with low signal areas, and then you also see it in the corona T2. MRA showed that the lesion had this uh, material, the office of the vascular channels within the area. That was suggested of a very powerful image. So we've seen this one already. So usually with the hemangioma, as it enhances, you see a mass-like lesion, not just the vessels, but a mass-like lesion within the area. So a similar lesion, so T2 having the signal for the areas. And T1 with contrast fat suppressed, then you see a mass like enhancing lesion. Hepatic hemangiomas, so we'll look at a couple of them and then we we'll move on. Hepatic hemangiomas are one of the most common primary liver tumors, and usually they are more of incidental findings. And studies have shown in autopsy that. You have, it ranges from 0.4 to about 20% of the general population of it. And cavernous hemangiomas arises from the epithelial cells 
that line with map placements and consists of multiple large hotspot channels lined by a single layer of epithelial cells. These tumors are frequently asymptomatic and incidentally discovered during an uh, imaging, surgery, or autopsy. Studies have shown that when the liver is erotic, usually you don't see hemorrhagic in them. And imaging plays a role in the hemorrhagic I think we are more used to having focal lesions. Usually they are small, but you can have them being large. But studies have shown that they can also be multiple. That's a multifocal type, and they could also be very diffuse. So we need to be careful when we are diagnosing other lesions and leaving out hepatic hemorrhagic. Another thing that it can help you is that usually the solitary ones usually resolve spontaneously on their own. And uh, GLUT1, which is supposed to be a good marker for diagnosing hemangiomas, will be negative because maybe they would have been um, undergone evolution already. When GLUT1 um, is positive, then it means that it's still um, in the proliferating or in the meeting phase. So, usually with a multiple and a multiple kind of diffuse type, the GLUT1 is positive. So these two images are ultrasound images, ray scale and Doppler. You see those well-defined small hypervigilant lesion. And then when you put color on it, you see peripheral fluid movement and characteristic for hemorrhagic. That's a CT scan also showing a, a focal small region in the liver, also suggestive of hemorrhagic. So when you do the um, three-phase dynamic study, it characterizes the lesion properly for you. So when you look at it very well, there's a small lesion here with peripheral enhancement. Then it increases in um, enhancement and then completely gets enhanced. The smaller lesion that was in the periphery also enhanced, but because it was small, everything enhanced and then it's washed out. So these are some of the ways that you can use your three phase um, liver study to characterize some of your lesions. On um, MRI, we also have something similar. So on T1, it's um, hypo-intense, on T2, it's hyper-intense, and it's very bright. But then when you do your three phase study, that's called the dynamic gadolinium enhanced magnetic resonance imaging, or the time one. So you're going to have peripheral enhancement of your lesion until finally it's completely enhanced and it washes out quickly. So that's the progressive centripetal enhancement going on in the liver. So that's the dynamic time result. So you also can have vertebral hemangiomas, and the, uh, it's common in the fourth decade and also in females. Thoracic spine is the most common location. And the classic appearance is the corduroy or the gel um, sign. So usually you have your vertebrae showing these um, prominent trabeculae, okay, that are vertically oriented. It's easier to pick them on the lateral than on the posterior anterior. So on CT, it even becomes more clearer. And with the ACL, you see what we call the polka dots. And then on the lateral, you see the jailhouse sign. So those are the jailhouse sign, showing multiple areas of human genome. And the way you do the ACL, you see the polka dots. MRI is so a good imaging modality that helps you see the total extent and other soft tissue and um, changes that will be present there. Because of the presence of fat, it will be bright on T1, and then on T2, it will be brighter because you have good fat and also water in it. So there's also another hemangioma in the top in the top of a, a digit. You realize that it's not the same like the chondroma, context intact, everything. It just the trabeculations that are more prominent in the top. Juvenile angiofibromas are more of the locally aggressive type. So all the things that you see will be similar to us we discussed, 
with the infant tumor. The only difference is that over here you're going to have locally aggressive changes. So the lesion will be infiltrating into adjacent areas. The most common location is around the terminal palatine and infratemporal fossa. So here you have this um, lesion that is heterogeneous in this T2 image. On T1, you realize that it was still um, hyper intense and then had this low signal areas. And then um, it's, it's infiltrating into the base of the nose over there. So look, usually they are locally aggressive. Then Andrew sarcomas, as we mentioned, are more of malignant lesions forming about 1% of sarcomas. And then usually it's commoner in males than in females, like cases of mastectomy where it's caused as a result of late leukemia, it will be more common in the females, and it's called the stewardship syndrome. So angiosarcomas can be anywhere, can be in the liver, breast, skin, muscles, bone, heart, the spleen, and usually because it's um, malignant, by the time of diagnosis, you may have metastasis either to the lungs or into the so on x-ray, what you see will be non-specific. You need to add clinical history and other things to make the definitive diagnosis. So hepatic angiosarcomas, they are rare. We we'll look at one example. It's still the third most common primary liver tumor. They have a variable appearance on both CT and MRI, reflecting the premorphic histologic nature. Prognosis is poor because by the time of diagnosis, most of the time, the lesions would have metastasized already. So usually they have about six months or about a year um, after diagnosis. It used to be called the kaffir cell uh, sarcoma, but the actual word from is rather hepatic angiosarcoma. sarcoma. And the most commonly in the sixth and seventh decade, common in males than in females. Clinically, um, the lesion can rupture, so the patient can present with spontaneous pneumoperitoneum, and they may have pain, abdominal pain, and hepatomegaly. And metastasis is usually to the lungs and to the spleen. Most of the time, it can arise spontaneously, but it can also be as a result of exposure to substances like thoracotrust. Uh, Arsenic and also radiation can be a risk factor. So, just like I mentioned with the um, general sarcomas, the angry sarcomas, the findings are similar, but the only thing is that most of the time they are not specific, but then you may have um, metastasis to other organs. If you do radio, like usually there's edit enhancement with FDG PET C. Because it's it has a resistance to chemotherapy and radiation, it's important that when you're making the diagnosis, you're able to tell whether it's in a segment that can be resected, because that's the mainstay of management, because it cannot uh, respond to chemotherapy or radiation. So there's um, a liver CT with contrast, showing multiple um, liver lesions that are peripherally enhancing and then there's another hypo-dense region within the skin, the pancreas is atrophic. And then on MRI, you see similar changes, and it's enhancing gradually with, within the anterior phase, suggesting of the vascular um, base. And of course, it's going to other the spleen, you should think of more of an angiosarcoma than just a multifocal uh, human gene. So with the vascular malformation, we have irregular network um, by their particular vessel type. So we have the lymphatic, capillary, venous, and arterial venous. You could also have combination of these malformations. So usually they are present at birth, they grow slowly, 
and they may retreat and destroy sometimes. And this one you definitely require intervention to manage it. So you have the fast flow and the slow flow types. The fast flow is where you have the arterial components, so the arterial venous malformations and the arterial arterial um, changes, either limbs and ectasia or stenosis. And also the fistula is there. The slow flow basically is capillary venous and So for arteriovenous malformation, as we've mentioned, there are high flow vascular malformations and there's abnormal connection between the artery and the vein at the level of the capillary. You could also have a fistula where you have a very small vessel connecting the artery and the vein. And state are shown that usually it's difficult to see that connection with your imaging. So I think yesterday we saw this, I borrowed it from and residence corner where you have this um, chest CT and the lung window. You see a night use over there, they see a feeding attribute to it. So, atrial venous malformation. So, with atrial venous malformation, CT and MRI are the basic imaging modalities to help you see. And usually, it's just vessels, you don't have a mass like the hemangioma where you saw it enhancing and giving you a mass like appearance. But sometimes you may have edema, a venous con congestion, or a little bit of fibrofighting micrometrics around it on your T2. So please make sure you differentiate that one from a hemangioma. So on ultrasound, what can you see? You usually see multiple um, anidos with a multiple feeding vessels. So you have a feeding artery and a draining vein. So that's what will be classic for our APMs when you're trying to um, look at them. And because um, there's direct connection between the, or the artery and the vein are close together, you can have arterial poles within the vein. On um, MRI, for arterial malformation, as we said, it's fast flowing, so it means that you are going to have signal void within these vessels, both on T1 and T2. And then if there's a thrombus or hemorrhage, you see a hyperintense area on T2, on T1. With gallo, it shows enhancement, and you see the feeding artery and then the draining vein. MRA is very important in making these diagnoses as you look for the artery and the vein. So here you have the signal void areas within the jaw and around the area on the left side. It's both similar on T1 and T2. And then with the MRA, you see that there are these multiple tubular enhancing vessels. They see a feeding actually in a clinic. So this one on CT was noticed that there are these dilated vessels over here. MRA was done and then the slide first vessel was seen and then I dose with a green and a feeding actually. A green vein and a feeding actually would be identified. Here you have three images from MRI and then here you're having signal void areas in the right paracel area. And then with the MRA, you see that this vein has filled too early while you are in the arterial phase. And so, but then there was no obvious connection, as we mentioned earlier, usually it's so tiny and difficult to image. But definitely there's an arteriovenous malformation and most likely it may be a fistulous. So we look at venous malformations, and so and that one is more of a low flow, and then to differentiate, the previously called cavernous hemangiomas of any organ, according to the current classification, are all uh, venous malformations. So you have hepatic, vertebral, orbital, uh, venous malformations. These venous malformations are non evolving and may apparently grow, uh, grow in size without perforative potential. 
On MRI, you are going to have hypo to isolate intense lesion resectations on T1 and hyper intense on T2. You may see fluid fluid levels and they may have heterogeneous appearance when it's hemorrhage or thrombus. There's no signal void areas um, because it's low flow. But then where there are calcifications, you can have um, areas of low signal. Flavulates, as I said, show a small full sign or signal void areas. And then with gadolinium, there's diffuse or heterogeneous enhancement when there's a thrombus or a, throm uh, a flavulate. You're usually going to have signal void areas. So with um, still on the MRA, if you do your enhancement and you do the dynamic time enhanced imaging, you're going to have a similar appearance as in the high flow agents. And then you can apply this technology just to differentiate the vascular malformation from other pathologies. So this uh, patient had a soft tissue mass and x-ray showed flavulates in it. And then on the MRI, T2 showed that it was hyper intense, having um, areas of signal void, heterogeneous in appearance, contrast should enhancement, we still having those uh, signal void areas, and this is thrown by all frequencies. Ultrasound can be helpful when they are superficial, where you see an heterogeneous lesion, sometimes with cystic areas. When you put the blood, those cystic areas will show flow, and then when you do the uh, spectra, you will see low flow within them. Doing MRA, CTA, or conventional angina will be the best way to make appropriate diagnosis. When they are heterogeneous, with uh, areas of signal void, both on T1 and T2, shows contrast enhancement, and management can be done with ethanol injection. So this is a venous malformation. It's almost looking mass like, like a hemangioma. But then if you do a dynamic time enhanced MRA, then you'll be able to uh, differentiate between the two. This patient had a mass over the chest and then steady showed that T1 hyper intense heterogeneous with low signal areas and similar on the T2 and also enhancing with contrast. What about lymphatic and for, uh, malformations? So the common areas are around the head and neck because that's where the lymphatic venous uh, drainage or the point where the lymphatic system joins the venous system. Okay, so that's the most common area of these lymphatic malformations. It can be macrocystic where it's uh, bigger than two centimeters and microcystic when it's less than two centimeters. Usually you see cluster of cells a cluster of cysts, and if it's macrocystic, then it's bigger, and when it's microcystic, then it's smaller, and you see more of tissue around it. And macrocystic are easier to diagnose than the microcystic. Ultrasound. What do you see? So you see cystic structures, multisectated, and it could be micro or macro, as we said. So depending on the contents, you may have internal echoes in it, making it hypo to iso epigenic. And then um, we've already the appearance depends on whether it's macro or micro system. So you may see septations and fluid levels within your system components. You may have protein hemorrhage within it, making it hyper or iso. So on MRI, the lymphatic malformations can be infiltrated so that the surrounding tissues may be involved and then you can see the other planes that have been, the, the lesion has been infiltrated into. And as we mentioned, they are cystic in nature, so it means that you're going to have it um, dark on T1, bright on T2. But depending on protein and thrombi hemorrhage in it, then you are going to have high signals within, within it on your T1. So with the macrocystic, you can have fluid fluid levels 
and expectations within it. So this one um, had the cystic mass within the right, right sorry, left mandibular angle, and then that's the ACL, that's the coronal. And then on T1, you see the lesion hypo, a small bright area over the possible of hemorrhage within the area. And then, as we said, you can manage it with injection of dehydrated alcohol. So remember we said that with the large ones, you can have fluid fluid levels and you can have hemorrhage in it. So on the RT, one sort of it being hyperintense, you can see some bright areas suggesting that there's hemorrhage into it. And you see the fluid fluid level here. Then you can see enhancement of the lesion as well around it. Just a periphery. So here too, you have a T2 hyperintense lesion, heterogeneous, with this focal area that is I saw to, but it's not as bright as the rest of the areas. And it showed enhancement in that area. This one was more of a venous, very lymphatic malformation. So, with the microcystic, on the other hand, usually they appear as solid mass because the cysts are tiny, tiny, tiny. And, and with little or oh, with no enhancement at all. And so here, this small baby had a mass in the forearm. And then putting light on it, it showed that it was transmutating, suggestive of fluid collection in there. And then the lesion was seen as a trigenous uh, mass with all these blue signal, signal void areas. And so you could see on T1 and on T2 then being bright. But they're brighter on the T1 and the T2 because it's more, it has some fatty components. So on MRA, you can also have distortion of the normal artery and vein if it's very, very big, giving you mass effect. Other than that, it's not supposed to show any contrast enhancement. So this is a CT scan at the root of the neck, showing the cystic structure at the base there, and diagnosis was small effect. This was in the 51 year old, and diagnosis was lymphatic malformation. So this one too is the MRI, MRA of this patient had a mass over there, but it did not show any enhancement. And other investigation showed that it was So you look at um, capillary malformations where it could be sporadic lesions where you have dilated capillary light channels occurs in about 0.3% of children and is present as can be present at any part of the body, but the most common or frequent area is the cervical facial region. They are categorized as medial or lateral, depending on the allocation. The medial ones usually gradually lighten the time and eventually disappear. And um, they have some local needs for it. So that's the stop bite of the nip of the neck. And the angel kisses on the forehead. The lateral ones are mostly the hot wine stains. And they have a protracted pulse. So those are the baby born with this low level change in skin, but then the skin is really not elevated, but then there's change in skin over in, and that's the bottom one skin. It can distribute over um, more of a, a nerve. So the trigeminal nerve is the most common distributing um, area where you have it. Usually they are painless, they occur spontaneously, and they don't bleed. And you have a flat red or purple with irregular borders. And if it occurs in deeper tissues, then you have to do other imaging to be able to be sure of what is happening. Most of the time, it's solitary, but then it, it can be syndromic. So you need to, when you see some of these lesions, think of something like Steve Weber or the critical genoli syndrome. So you need to think about Diagnosis is 
is basically physical examination. And if you want to look out for um, deeper structure ones, you can do MRI. Usually, they are, they are not pain. When they are painful and they spontaneously bleed, then do MRI because then they would be something else that you are doing. So, we look at a few syndromes. So, when evaluating a child with a vascular anomaly, it's important to evaluate patient for syndromes associated with specific vascular lesions. Although rare, these conditions may be a potential source of morbidity and mortality for patients. And early identification may lead to better clinical outcome. So, we look at KTS, where you have three basic things that's what was coordination. That you have the port wine skin. You have a capillary venous or lymphatic malformation. So they said that it's a more of a wastebasket um, thing because it can be any of the malformations. Then you have hypertrophy of the soft tissue or uh, the bone, giving you lip discrepancy. Then they have shown that having any two of this is still diagnostic. <laughs> Just like the human beings, I get you. I'm almost done. Okay. So look out for these three things to make your diagnosis. But if you see any two of it, you can still make your diagnosis. So this patient had bigger um, right leg, the whole leg, it was also longer than the other one. And there was also the pulse um, small. A huge webinar yesterday we saw in our uh, president's corner. So you have a primary formation that could be the skin, brain, eye, and a pot wine stain. Pot wine stain. And usually they represent the seizures, mental retardation. They can have eye abnormalities because they may have malformations um, in the vessels to the eye. And they also have glaucoma because of that. I borrowed this one too from residents on ISD. So we have CT scan showing um, atrophy of the frontal parietal, most of the hospital region with some. Carry form calcification. Similarly, you can see also on the right side of this other CT image. These are some of the facial presentation of patients with huge weather, having the post wine and having the um, asymmetric enlargement of the area. MRI, you may see uh, atrophy, then you may see signal going over the diary representing. Um, the calcifications and usually we have enhancement by the young. When you see that you need to look at the eye as well, if you see any abnormal contrast enhancement, then it may be suggested thickening, then it may be suggested that the eye is involved. We also look at the face syndrome where you have posterior full cell malformations, hemangiomas, arterial anomalies, cardiac anomalies, eye or endocrine anomalies. The S has been added because some experts say that they can have sternal clefts, supraumbilical arteries, ventral closure defects. So when you see them, they go for more of a face. So in this case, they usually may have problems with all those areas that I mentioned: the heart, the eye, the neurology system. So once you see the features clinically, then all these systems and areas need to be looked at. So this is a baby that had a very large postwine. And when it's distributing over a, a segment, then you think more of the face. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Because the first is the one that I've seen that I've paused through the time as well. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs>